Hello, welcome along. It is the Fun Kids Science Weekly. I, I actually think I'm going to put it out there that this is the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. I'll tell you why. We're the only ones that are actually brave enough to look at some of the secrets that that universe holds. You're listening to Dan. Thank you so much for finding us. This week, we'll talk about the only poisonous crustacean on the planet. We'll also hear about an 18,000-year-old dog. And we'll learn about two space missions that are rolling into one. I've also got some of your questions to answer. Uh, Today, they're about blood and about rabies. That's on the way after we see how some stuff that you use every single day is made. This is Sir Sidney McSprocket. How's it made? Oh, hello. Sir Sidney McSprocket here. I've been in action capturing facts all about manufacturing. It's for this rather splendid stipendiary compendium I'm compiling. You just ask it how something is made, and it'll oblige with a fulsome explanation. I bet you've kicked a football or two. Maybe you've scored a goal. When you're watching a big match on the telly, have you ever wondered how they put those balls together? Well, let's find out. Now, the footballs used in the Premier League may look fairly simple. After all, they're just a ball. (laughs) But a lot of hard work goes into making sure each one does its job perfectly with no foul-ups. Step one. The material used to make a football is made of several layers. The top layer is a foam coated in polyurethane. This is a smooth material which stops the ball getting scuffed. Step two. This layer is then glued to a fabric which provides the strength. Rollers are used to press these layers together so they won't come apart. Step three. You may have noticed that a football is made up of lots of many-sided shapes. Twenty hexagons and twelve pentagons will be punched out of the material and grouped together to be sent to the stitchers. Step four. These shapes are then stitched by hand. It takes three hours to complete one ball. Then it's ready to have its valve added. That's the little hole where you pump it up. Step five. Once pumped up, the ball is thoroughly checked. They must be within five millimetres of 64 centimetres in diameter and weigh between 425 and 445 grams. And undergo tests to make sure they can withstand heat, pressure, water, oh, and of course, a lot of kicking. Step six. Only the balls which meet the tough standards will reach the pitch. Meaning that if you don't shoot that goal, well, you can't blame the ball. New technology is being developed to use fewer pieces and use glue instead of stitching. But it's a manufacturing process that is taken very seriously. Almost as seriously as the game itself. Now, I must get on, but come back soon and find out more about manufacturing with my splendid stipendiary compendium. How's it made? With support from the Royal Commission for the 1851 Exhibition. Find out more at funkidslive.com. Now, last weekend, I was at a live show for Fun Kids, our radio station, and I met loads and loads and loads of incredible Science Weekly fans. I couldn't believe it. If that was you, thank you so much if you were there at our epic roadshow adventure, and you came over and you said hello and told me how much you love the podcast. The thing is... Uh, uh, quite a few people also did ask me how to send in their science questions uh, and it's just so easy it's the same as it's always been you need to get to the apple podcast store find the fun kids science weekly on there and leave us a review at the bottom there's a comment box that's where you stick your questions uh, cal from america has done that cal asks how does rabies affect our bodies well cal rabies is a virus it affects the nervous system and then finally it leads to the brain Usually it's spread through bites from an infected animal. 
First off, you get flu-like symptoms, you know, when you're feeling a little under the weather and you can't get out of bed. It's that kind of stuff. You know, you get nausea, you get fever, you get headaches. As my mum says, it probably comes out of both ends. Then perhaps you might feel some paralysis. You may start to hallucinate. And what kills you? Uh, is it causes excitotoxicity. It overstimulates the brain. It causes cells to die. The problem with rabies is once the symptoms usually start, it's too far along for you to be properly cured. The only way to actually stop rabies properly is to not be around the animals that you think might have it. Thank you so much for the question, Cal. Uh, Another one, this is from Rory over here in the UK, who asks, what are white blood cells made of? White blood cells are about 1% of your blood, but they've got a massive impact. They protect you against illnesses and disease. They're your immunity cells. They're pretty much always at war with foreign invaders into your body. They're made in the bone marrow, stored in tissues, but they only last for a few days, so you're always making new ones. And you get a few types of white blood cells in there. You've got the neutrophil, which targets bacteria, uh, the eosinophil, which gets parasites, the basophil, which helps inflammatory response, and the lymphocyte, which helps antibodies, and the monocyte, which moves around the body, helping things. They're all in the white blood cells. That's what make it up. The thing is, for your question, Rory, they're made up of cells. That's what white blood cells are. They are cells. They are made of molecules and acids and carbohydrates and proteins. What makes white blood cells stand out, though, is that they have nuclei, which not really many cells do. So thank you so much for those questions. If you've got one that you want answered on the show, as I said, dead easy, leave it as a review for us over on the Apple Podcast Store. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Uh, We're joined by uh, some more podcast makers this week. They make the Tumble podcast a fantastic science show. We have Lindsay, we have Marshall on the line. Hello, guys. Hey. Hey. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. No, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, I'm a little bit bummed out that there are more than one science podcast in the world, (laughs) but, um, you know, it's such a big subject that there's so many different ways to talk about it. Can you just tell us what you do over at Tumble? Sure. Well, as you said, um, Tumble is a science podcast for kids, and we explore stories of science discovery. So that means that we really try to share stories about how science works, how we know what we know. And we interview scientists about their stories of research and weave that into a story um, that's filled with a lot of humor, a lot of laughter, and a lot of interesting facts, and more importantly, um, a lesson about how science actually works on the grand scale. Like, how do you think like a scientist? And, and from what you've learned so far, how, how do you think and learn like a scientist? Well, I think, I mean, it begins with, I think, the same way you think and learn about anything. You just have a question and then you try to construct a way to find the answer. Yeah. And what we find is that scientists are just normal, curious people who are actually driven by a lot of the same things that kids are when they get interested in science. It's, you know, how does this work? Why is this like that? And they have amazing ways of answering these questions and finding fascinating things. And the stories of how they get there are super interesting. Now we're talking about stories. I know in your last episode, the most recent one, you've been talking about the science of snot. Yes. (laughs) Can you just help explain why you asked that, what you then did, how you investigated it? Kind of take us through the whole thing for us. Well, our sort of uh, shortcut is to talk to scientists who know what they're talking about and ask them our questions. So in this case, we talked to a zoologist named Danny Rabiotti, and she's written books with her co-author, Nick Caruso, about gross things that animals do. So this one is about snot, saliva, and slime. It's just like the whole world of sticky secretions. And the book is called Believe It or Snot. So so we talked to her about what, you know, why do we make snot? Um, what purpose does it serve? And 
how do animals use snot in a way that's completely different and far more creative than we do? <laughs> and, and there's something about a slime rating system, isn't there? Marshall, can you just tell us about that? <laughs> Well, so in the book, Believe It or Snot, all the animals are rated on a scale from, I believe it's one to five snot splats. <laughs> yeah, one is or zero. Actually, it starts from zero to five. Zero is not slimy at all, quite dry. And then five is so much slime, make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, you, do you think we might be able to have a little sneak peek um, and look at w w one that's right up there, one that's probably got a number five, the most slimy creature of all? Can you just tell us a little bit about this and then we'll play in the clip? Yeah, if we want to start with that, that is definitely a, an animal called the hagfish. It's a little kind of eel-like creature that lives in the deep sea and it developed a kind of snot making as a defense mechanism. <laughs> it's a total slime bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Slime bomb. Uh, okay. Um, well, well, let's have a listen to that then. This is a clip from uh, from the Tumble podcast, uh, The Science of Snot. This is all about the hagfish. Unsurprisingly, we did not find an animal that beat the hagfish on sliminess. The hagfish was just the slimiest animal. They can just produce so much slime so quickly. You put them in a bucket and then you run your hand through the bucket and the bucket is just slime. Litres and litres of slime one animal is able to produce. Wait. So, so what's a hagfish? So a hagfish kind of looks like an eel, but with a lot less of a head. Okay, I mean, that's a really low standard for amount of head. <laughs> it does have eyes and a mouth, but they look kind of weird. Um, so yeah, kind of a weird eel is how I would describe them. Hagfish have slime glands running up and down their bodies. When they release just a teaspoon of slime gunk, it expands by 10,000 times in less than half a second, which is how this happened. There was even um, a truck full of hagfish going down the motorway and it crashed and the hagfish went all over the motorway and they like slimed an entire car. The whole car was just covered in slime. The whole road was covered in slime. And that's really an, another level of slime. Like what other animal has slimed an entire motorway? There's none as far as I know, so. I don't know of any either. Of course, hagfish didn't evolve this skill in order to slime cars. That is a useful side effect. <laughs> and they normally do that to deter predators. So if a shark comes along and eats a hagfish, it just gets gills and gills full of slime. And obviously the shark can't breathe in slime. So then it spits the hagfish out. So I've seen a video of this and it's just totally incredible because you can see the look on the predator's face <laughs> as it spits out the hagfish and it's like, I've made such a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's so incredibly clever. <laughs> hagfish definitely win the category, so much slime make it stop. <laughs> So that was all about the hagfish, which is like a whopper, right, Marshall? That's like a number five on the on, on the slime scale. Um, They're pretty slimy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you said it starts at zero, there's five points there. It's not all about how much slime you produce, but also about what you do with uh, your slime. Can you tell us about some of the creative ways? Well, so... Um the one we talk about in the episode that I think is really funny is the parrotfish, which uh, uses basically snot sleeping bags. <laughs> so it sleeps among the coral reefs, and every single night it has to make itself a new bed. <laughs> um, so, so it vomits it up and then crawls inside. <laughs> well, it's one way to keep warm. Let's have a little <laughs> listen to, a, to, to Tumble to find out. Really, some of the harsh brutalities of life in the wild. Moving up the slime leaderboard, parrotfish score three slime splats with what Danny calls the most creative use of slime on the planet. I just really enjoy the fact that every night these daisy parrotfish just vomit out this slime bag, which encloses their whole body, and then they just sleep in it and it keeps all the parasites off them at night. I think that's just a really cool use and it sounds really cozy. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> so their bedtime is what? I guess go to the bathroom, get their PJs on, and then vomit themselves a slimy sleeping bag and crawl in and fall asleep. Yeah. Where do they fit the stories in? <laughs> Where do they do their bedtime reading? All right, honey, pick out a book. <laughs> Already. <laughs> 
so, so we're talking about snot. We've learned about the most snotty creature, a really creative, warming way of having snot. But also, here's the thing. Um, I quite like eating a bogey. <laughs> oh, wow, you're willing to go on record with yeah, that. Yeah, sure, why not? Very brave. I mean, I, come on, I've seen my nan eating a bogey. If it comes from my body, is there any hard to it going right back in? <laughs> Well, we asked Danny this exact same question because it is something that's quite common, but also quite taboo is, you know, you've got something out of your coming out of your nose and your mouth is right underneath it. <laughs> but is is that a good practice? I mean, surely it's just a one like way system. Yes, yes. Do, do you like the taste, Marshall? <laughs> Uh, no comment. <laughs> That's covered in the clip, actually. <laughs> well, let's have a listen. So what happens if, say, like, someone might eat their boogers because they like the salty flavor? Um, I mean, who, who would like the salty <laughs> flavor, Marshall? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say. <laughs> so what I would say is, okay, it is kind of natural to eat what we all call in the UK bogeys because a lot of animals do it. You often see, especially apes, because they've got fingers picking their nose. But that doesn't mean that you should do it. It is not good for you. Mucus is kind of like our nose's filter to the world. It catches all the germs, dust, and other tiny particles in the air. By the time it dries out and becomes boogers, it's full of bad stuff. You don't want to be putting that in your mouth, so I would say, yeah, definitely not healthy. All right, no more booger snacks. Not even a nice tapenade. <laughs> So there we go, just a little drip feeding, a tiny tease of all the science uh, of snot uh, with the, the guys. slow nasal drip, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Straight into your mouth, Marshall. Uh, <laughs> with the guys over at Tumble. It's a, if, if you love this show, um, I insist that you have a listen to Tumble. How can we go about finding out more about the science of snot? So you can subscribe and listen to tumble science for kids wherever you get podcasts from apple Podcasts to stitcher to whatever your favorite podcast listening app is and just search for tumble science for kids yeah i hope you can edit this just search for tumble science podcast for kids and we're also at science podcast for kids.com Brilliant. Well, I, you know, I can't wait to find out more uh, about snotty, slimy stuff. Never going to use it as a sleeping bag, though. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, guys, for coming on the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Really appreciated linking up with you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. For this week's Dangerous Dan, we're looking at what I think might be our first crustacean on this part of the show. I think it has to be because there are over 70,000 different crustaceans. You know, mostly they have shells, uh, crabs, lobsters, prawns, wood lice. But a few years ago, scientists found the first of the species that was actually deadly. They're called Ramipedes. Now, they look like white centipedes. They're found in caves along the edge of the ocean in the twisting tunnels that head underground and into the sea. And in those dark, salty worlds you'll find a long, thin and blind ramipede. They're perhaps the only poisonous crustacean on the planet. On either side of their head, behind their jaws, they have fangs, where a pair of harp, uh, a pair of sharp, sorry, hollowed tipped teeth. And they're extremely smart with them. One set of its muscles pumps venom into the fangs, the other stabs the fangs forward, pushing the venom out. Now, scientists think that it doesn't just poison its prey, it's also much worse. It injects it with a toxin that paralyzes another creature so the victim can't move. And how amazing is this? It doesn't chew its food like most creatures. Instead, it liquefies the prey. It kind of churns up the insides and then sucks out their juices. And it makes perfect sense because the animal kingdom is all about survival, the survival of the fittest. Only the fittest, only the smartest creatures make it through alive and they evolve. And in a dark cave, where there isn't much food about, the ramipede has to make sure that it eats when it can and be mightily efficient with its poison. It's time to have a look at the weather and the climate right now on the show uh, with our genius guru, Marina Ventura. And this is from her Climate Explorers series. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers. Hi there. 
Marina Ventura here. I love finding out about the natural world, and that includes the Earth's climate. We know that weather can change from one day to the next, but climates can change too over the time span of years, centuries, or even longer. So I'm on a mission to fill MapApp with the latest climate information with the help of some awesome climate explorers. Come on then, let's go. Do you know how to tell the age of a tree? Maybe you know it's something you find when you cut into the trunk. It's the rings, right? By counting the rings, you can find out the age of a tree. Have a look out for tree stumps next time you're in the park or woods, and you can count them for yourself. You might also know that those rings hold clues to the climate in the past. Wet years will mean wider gaps between the rings as the tree grew very quickly, whereas very dry years will have a narrower gap as the tree didn't grow much that year. That's right, Marina. Forests can help unlock many more secrets about the climate. They take carbon dioxide from the air and store it in trees, plants and the soil. They are also home to much of the world's wildlife. Time to meet our next climate explorer. Hi, I'm Phil and I'm a forest scientist. Maybe you've been learning at school that forests are important, and one reason is that trees, like all plants, absorb carbon dioxide, which is a gas we exhale, and which is a waste product from burning fossil fuels. The more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet becomes. So it's great that plants store carbon, but how can we tell how much? I suppose trees don't have a list of ingredients on the side like a packet of crisps. Unfortunately not. I use lasers to estimate the weight of trees. This helps us to figure out how much carbon, something we call biomass, there is in the environment and how it's moving between plants and the atmosphere. Sometimes we use satellites to measure the forest as well. We use a variety of technology to gather as much information as we can. Wow! Lasers! Sounds pretty exciting. I'd like a laser like that. No, they don't make that kind of noise. It would be fun if they did. It's really important for us to be able to measure this because we know that humans are causing damage to forests. This damage is not just caused by chopping down trees, but also when fires are used to clear the ground. As well as releasing carbon back into the atmosphere, cutting down forests can affect the local climate and environment. Rainfall patterns can be disrupted also. That's important for local people. And by removing the forests, we are also threatening the animals and plants that live there with extinction. Once a forest is cleared, modern industrial farming can decrease the soil's nutrients, releasing more carbon into the atmosphere. So by measuring the amount of carbon in forests, we get a clearer picture of how important they are for protecting our planet against climate change. Good work, Phil. Really valuable stuff. We've met a few climate explorers now, and something they all have in common is that gathering information is an important part of their jobs. That's right. Whether it's from the clouds or volcanoes, the seabed or the rainforests. And we've gathered lots of new information too. Ready for upload, Mappy? Load me up! Next time, we'll be doing some puddle jumping and finding out how we can learn about climate change from flooding right here in the UK. See you soon. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers, supported by the Natural Environment Research Council, the science of the natural world. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash marina. Right, let's get this week's science in the news. You see, researchers are trying to determine whether an 18,000-year-old puppy found in Siberia in Russia is a dog or maybe a wolf. The canine was just two months old when it died, but it's been preserved brilliantly in permafrost. All its fur, its nose and its teeth are intact, but they can't figure out what species it is, which is important because they say it could give a massive link between wolves and modern dogs. Also, two of the most exciting space missions of the 2030s, over a decade away, are likely now to be launched within a year of each other. The European Space Agency are poised to increase their budget, which means it will be possible to build a big X-ray telescope and three satellites to sense the collision of black holes. They need to fly together, hopefully, because the data that they get will work in tandem. And brilliant news, it could happen. And finally, bags for life uh, in the UK are adding to the amount of single-use plastic it's what they were brought in to stop the amount brought last year rose by one and a half billion now households in the uk uh, buy an average of 54 bags for life and although they are meant to be preventing the use of single bags they're actually adding to it And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for giving us a listen. Remember, if you've got a science question in your mind, something that you want answered on this show, something that's just niggling around your brain that you just can't figure out, you can let me do all the hard work for you. 
I will get you the answer. Just leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. While you're there, it's a brilliant place for you to hear all the science series that we do. You've heard some today. You heard Sydney McSprocket in Marina Ventura. We've got loads more. You can get it there. You can get it wherever you get your shows from. You know, Google on Spotify. They're on the free Fun Kids app as well. And Fun Kids, we're a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app. And at funkidslive.com, 